So the Ralph Nader election, um, the uh, 2000 election, a lot of people are blaming Ralph Nader uh, for stealing the election. He stole the election from Gore, is what they said. Nader's Nader's plan was always to be bigger than what um, you know what what the the Democrats would say that it is. Uh, they say uh, Ralph Nader is saying that the heart of the Democratic Party is gone, and therefore he is working to get it back in with a viable third party movement. I've been looking for an article where he presented ten ideas for what Al Gore could have ran on, and he could have you know won over the Nader voters. Nader, he, everybody, either you're a spoiler, spoiler for everybody or you're a spoiler for nobody. It's one way or the other. And so to sit there and just say, you know, that you, um, that he stole the election, it's just, it's bullshit. But the, uh, the biggest issues is that Al Gore lost the election because he didn't talk about progressive issues. Al Gore was a conservative. Al Gore picked Joe Lieberman who eventually dropped out of the Democratic Party and became Republican and, uh, you know, uh, endorsed John McCain. So that's that's the kind of Al Gore we would have had. You People will say we wouldn't have had all this and we wouldn't have had all that under Bush, you know, because of Nader. There's other candidates also running besides Nader. So, you know, uh, Al Gore was a conservative. Al Gore was a conservative Democrat, and there is a bunch of issues that he could have ran on that he would have got the Nader voters had he actually talked about having a progressive spirit or a progressive heart. But instead, the Democrats are always trying to be Republican light. They try to, you know, be like a Republican, just like Allison Lundergan Grimes. Instead of speaking up for their issues and the progressive issues that they stand for, instead they get pummeled. So I'm having a little bit of Nader nostalgia, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about Nader. So here's an article or a something he had wrote. He said, The emergence of a new left and the sudden upsurge of an anti-corporate electoral campaign are the products of the last 25 years of class polarization. A new political awakening becomes visible in the growth of struggles in the last few years. Even a partial list is impressive. Opposition to the NATO bombing of Serbia, growing yearly demonstrations against the School of the Americas, various fights around police brutality, the fight to save Mumia Abu Jamal, the growth of the United Students against sweatshops, new opposition to the death penalty, South Carolina's fight against the Confederate flag, the defense of affirmative action in Florida, and the strike of janitorial workers in California. And then he's absolutely right. Look at that. That's a nice little clip in time. You know, here is what was going on, um, you know, not just what, 10 fucking years ago? So, in fact, I almost, you might even say Occupy might have been because of Nader. Uh, so Nader, you know, Ralph Nader's plan wasn't, he wasn't trying to win the election. He was trying to, his intent was to siphon off enough votes, but that's how you become relevant. You become politically relevant because you're a player. And that's what the Democrats hated about Nader was that he was a player. Instead of actually, you know, they went with the Republican tactic of just tear down his character. He's a bastard. It's all about ego. Fuck him. And they didn't talk about the issues. They didn't talk about what he was actually running for. You want to, you know, you want to take Nader votes? Well, talk about the issues and get the people that Nader inspires to come out to vote. Because Nader didn't just siphon all votes. He also inspired new people to come vote. Nader give people who had wanted to vote their conscience and voted for somebody that he brought those people out to go vote. He also got independents and he got Republicans. So he was, you know, taking everybody's votes. He was taking votes of the other candidates as well as the, um, you know, the people that wouldn't even have voted. So he took, like, non-voting people, right? So to say he's a fucking spoiler is fucking stupid. It's a, it's a character attack. It's a logical fallacy. Um, these issues, the various fights around police brutality, good fucking issue. Mumia Abu Jamal, look at the shit that fucking Nader is in favor of. This is, you know, every one of these things are fucking badass fucking issues. So, um, Nader, let's see, let's, let's dispel the myth that he stole the election, okay? So they said the Democratic Party was that, you know, if uh, Nader's votes came from people, let's see, it's a myth because here's what people were saying. They said that they're siphoning votes off, right? In Florida, CNN's exit polling showed Nader taking the same amount of votes from both Republicans and Democrats, 1%. Ralph Nader also took 4% of the independent vote. Had Nader not run, Bush would have won by more in Florida. CNN's exit polls showed Bush at 49% and Gore at 47%, with 2% not voting in a hypothetical Naderless Florida race. 
If Nader hadn't run, about half of the Nader voters would have stayed home, according to exit polls. So half the fucking votes were from people that would not have even came out to vote. So no, they weren't Gore's votes. He did not fucking steal the election. What he did was create a more robust democracy. He added new ideas and new flavors. And in fact, because he is the third party candidate, his platform became the the core of the Democratic platform. You know, Al Gore, these fucking, you know, Democrats get up there and they say absolutely nothing and then they get in there and do as the fuck as they please. Uh, Ralph Nader presented a lot of fucking popular ideas and shit that they should have been talking about. And then once they got elected because they had talked about nothing, they went with the ideas. He talked, you know, Nader was saying not just health care. He was talking about single payer health care. He was talking about single payer health care before anybody else was saying it. So if you want a health care system, what kind of health care system do you want? Nader already had it defined for us. So a single payer, just the government takes care of it all. They called it a public option. And you know, we're going to get a public option. Well, can we? We can buy private insurance with our, you know, government subsidies, but can we get uh, a government insurance? And the question is, and the answer to that is no. Barack Obama's Obamacare was a sellout to the private insurance company, and they allowed you you have to buy private insurance if you want coverage in America. So it was a step in the right direction. There was reform. People, doctors, people have been nicer. And so it has caused, you know, good things in America. It's, we're the last industrialized nation to help health care. And when we get health care, what kind of plan are we going to get? So Nader was, you know, um, um, before his time on that issue too. And how embarrassing that if you speak the truth, you're disqualified from American politics. Look at this guy. He's talking the truth. He's disqualified. Look at Mike Gravel. Mike Gravel speaking from his heart. Nah, he's disqualified. Get him out of here. He's not taking it serious. He is taking it serious. The issues that matters most to him, you know, he was emotional about. The war, people dying. Good. Good. I'm glad Mike Gravel was there speaking the goddamn truth. And, um, you know, the 60s, they were able to kick out two presidents because of illegal wars. We've got, you know, 13, 14 years in war and counting. Where is the anti-war movement? Where are the progressives at? We saw Occupy briefly come out, but the Tea Party was able to turn their movement into elected officials. But Occupy has not been able to turn their movement into elected officials. But Kentucky could do it this year. We could do it this year. We could do it under Jeff Young. And, um, you know, when, come win or lose, Jeff Young will be in, influential in Kentucky politics. If he wins, we'll have the best damn state we'll ever seen. If he loses, his issues, the issues that he talks about will reverberate and will be talked about until time immemorial. He'll be the only one presenting any issues. He'll be the only one talking about what needs to happen. And he'll present a lot of good ideas. Him, you know, him being able to speak truth to power, that's the, that's his, um, you know, sort of his strength. That's his advantage. He's able to speak his mind, whereas the other ones are so beholden to corporate paymasters, they have to fucking, you know, seem like they're populist, play the political theater, um, but meanwhile, sucking corporate donors and wealthy bankers' dicks behind closed doors. And so that's that's the problem. That's the problem. So why did Gore lose to Bush? The Democrats. That's why. So, you know, um, this is the biggest one here, I think. So everyone seems to forget that there are more than three candidates running for office. In fact, there are 10 candidates that got more than the ultimate 537 margin in Florida. For instance, Monica Moorhead, the Workers' World Party candidate, got 1,804 votes. I think we can be certain that people that voted for Moorhead wouldn't have voted for Bush. So why blame Nader and not Moorhead? In fact, that's exactly what Michael Moore does. Had Monica not been on the ballot, it is safe to assume that at least 300 of her supporters would have voted for Al Gore. Exit polls confirm this fact. Gore was the second choice of over half of the Moorhead voters. A vote for Monica was a vote for Bush. In case you missed it, Michael Moore is being sarcastic. Please read the article. You see that does that he doesn't buy the vote and Nader a vote for Nader's a vote for Bush for a second. Blaming Monica for Bush winning is actually more reality based than blaming Nader. He had eighteen. You know, Monica Moorhead got eighteen hundred and four votes. The Workers World Party. So you want to talk about a progressive siphoning all votes eighteen oh four? So did Monica Moorhead 
lose the election for Al Gore? Was that the reason why Al Gore lost? I mean, the election was stolen, right? Bush got the Supreme Court and his daddy's buddies to call it for him. They didn't do the recount. So we're not even mentioning the fucking Supreme Court in this argument, are we? but Monica Moorhead. She got 1,804 votes. Is it her, her fault? What about David McReynolds of the Socialist Party? He got 622 votes. That's, again, higher than the 537. So David McReynolds, James E. Harris, and Monica Moorhead are three candidates in the Florida election that could have taken, you know, hypothetically the same amount of votes. Why don't anybody blame James E. Harris? God damn you, James E. Harris. It's your damn fault for why Bush is in office. God damn it, motherfucking David McReynolds and Monica Moorhead. It's your fault. He, they, they cost the election. No, because they, they didn't cost the election. To assume so would mean that you even knew them. So maybe that's why they attacked Nader, because he is actually somewhat well known. He built up a movement. Monica Moorhead, David McReynolds, James E. Harris was able to get a couple hundred votes. Um, but why was that? Because the people came out to them and said, well, do I want Bush or Gore? Nah, fuck it. I'm going to throw my vote away and vote for one of these socialist candidates. No. No, they believed in the socialist candidate. They're probably their buddies or they heard him talk or something. So they voted for the people that they believed in. And what a difference. I would rather vote for somebody I believe in and not get it than vote for someone I didn't believe in and get it. And that's Eugene Debs. I would rather vote for somebody that I wanted and not win, then to vote for somebody I didn't want, and then not win that, so, oh, you know, I voted against Mitch McConnell, Allison came out pretty strong, her being Democrat, I assumed she would be more progressive, she didn't talk about many progressive issues, and that's fucking disappointing as fuck, she wasn't able to inspire people to go out and vote for her, uh, she didn't stand up for progressive principles, so I have no idea really what even she stands for, she says she's a Democrat, then talked about all these Republican issues, well, which are you? Did you vote for McCain? Did Allison Lundergan Grimes vote for McCain? She wouldn't tell us who she voted for. Maybe that's what it was. Maybe she fucking voted for the goddamn Republicans. She was talking Republican, being Republican light, not talking about the issues, not taking her licks. Even Barack Obama said that. He says that if Democrats want to win, they got to start standing up for different issues and take their licks. They're going to call you socialists. They're going to call you names. They're going to fucking harass you and haggle you. Uh, but that's that's part of the game. And so you got to fucking, you know, weather the storm and just be right. Let your actions and let your, you know, work dictate how people remember you. So James E. Harris, David McReynolds, and Monica Moorhead are all three candidates that stole the election in 2000. Ah, uh, fuck you. You know, the issues that Gore could have talked about. He could have talked about health care. He could have talked about a bunch of stuff. Um... Let's see, there are some people, Tony Morrison and Gloria Steinman, some other ones, denounced Nader. They attacked Nader's call to cut USA to Israel as irresponsible. He says cut the aid off to Israel. They keep massacring Palestinians. You got Rand Paul who's talking about cutting aid off to Palestine. Didn't get much coverage. That's acceptable. It's okay to go ahead and cut the lifeline off of the Palestinians and let them get fucking uh, genocided. Let them get totally fucking wiped out just like the Native Americans did. Uh, but, uh, you know, cut the aid to the military fucking machine that's bullying every motherfucker in the Middle East. They say it's irresponsible and inflammatory. Uh, Nader and his supporters were accused of Orwellian utterances given to disingenuous claims about a risk. So basically, they're not even, they're just mad about the strategy and the tactic of Nader, but they're not actually saying that he's a bad dude, except for the fucking Israel thing. That's, they're going to talk about Israel. That's what you guys are fucking defending, Israel. Let's defend America first. You know, what happened to America first? Everybody, everybody loving Israel. Israel better than America? In fact, that's what some people said about the Iraq war. It happened because of Israel. Uh, because America defends Israel. Iraq was the biggest enemy to Israel in the region at the time. So we went after Israel's enemies. We're taking care of our allies' enemies and shit with our blood, our treasure. And... Um, and, you know, how do you feel about that, America? You got another country dictating your policy. China's getting, you know, bailed us out of this fucking 2008 capitalistic crisis. So now they got fucking influence. How's that feel, America? You got China. You got fucking, you know, you're kissing Saudi Arabian ass. You Saudi Arabian dick suckers. You fucking sucking Israel's dick, sucking fucking China's dick. You guys are not, you know, you're supposed to be self-reliant and shit. Our own government ain't even fucking self-reliant. Our own government don't even fucking take care of its own house, cleaning everybody else's house. And they clean in dictators' houses, you know? The 60s, 70s, 80s, 
They, how many times did we bomb Latin America? I mean, what, how many times did we defend dictators? We've done this shit over and over again. We've done it for a long time. So, let's look at some of the numbers. There's no evidence that Nader is responsible for Gore's defeat. Nader's votes... Uh, Nader's vote was in most cases much less than the margin between Gore and Bush. For example, Nader's 375,000 votes total in California is significantly less than the comfortable 1.2 million vote margin received by Gore over Bush statewide. In New York, Nader's 223,000 votes could have all been given to George W. Bush, and Gore would have easily carried the state by more than a million votes. In the majority of states where Nader's overall vote exceeded his national average, including Alaska, where he won 10%. 7% in Vermont, 6% in Hawaii, 6% in Maine, 6% in Rhode Island, 6% in Massachusetts, 5% in Utah, 5% in Colorado. The elections were not in doubt. They're safe states. If you live in a safe state, safely Republican, Kentucky is a safe state. They will vote for the Republican candidate safely. Your vote don't matter. The Republicans nor the Democrats spend any time in your state because you ain't a swing state. You're not one of the first states in the fucking primary. You're not a swing state. Nobody gives a fuck. Gore narrowly managed to carry several states, such as Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and New Mexico, where the Nader vote was larger than Gore's final margin of victory over Bush. But Gore also lost several states he should have carried had he devoted more time and resources, such as Arizona and Nevada, and where the Nader vote was insignificant. What a close reading of voting statistics does show, however, is that Al Gore is largely responsible for his own defeat. He didn't even win his home state in Tennessee. 47% of the Bush is 51. Nader's 20,000 votes in Tennessee would not have made any difference. The same story happened in Bill Clinton's Arkansas, where, which Gore lost to Bush. 46 to 51%. Nader's 1% in Arkansas didn't affect the outcome. West Virginia so, so we're ignoring the rest of America. The whole election was all about Florida. The whole fucking thing. Oh, come on. Truth is, Nader raised the level of debate. He raised the level of discussion. I'm going to end off with uh, Chris Hedges. Chris Hedges begins a 2010 article. There are no major institutions in American society, including the press, the educational system, the financial sector, labor unions, the arts, religious institutions, and our dysfunctional political parties that could be considered democratic. The intent, design, and function of these institutions controlled by corporate money are to bolster the hierarchical and anti-democratic power of the corporate state. These institutions often mouth in liberal values of bet and perpetuate mountain inequality. They operate increasingly in secrecy. They ignore suffering or sacrifice human lives for profit. They control and manipulate all levers of power and mass communication. They muzzle the voices and concerns of citizens. They use entertainment, celebrity gossip, and mostly laden public relation lies to seduce us into believing in a Disney world fantasy of democracy. The menace we face does not come from the insane wing of the Republican Party, which may make huge inroads in the coming elections, but the institutions tasked with protecting democratic participation... Do not fear Glenn Beck or Sarah Palin. Do not fear the Tea Party movement, the birthers, the legions of conspiracy theorists to the militias. Fear the underlying corporate power structure, which no one from Barack Obama to the white ring nutcases who pollute the airwaves can alter. If the hegemony of the corporate state is not soon broken, we will descend into a technologically enhanced age of barbarism. Investing emotional and intellectual energy in electoral politics is a waste of time. Resistance means a radical break with the former, formal structures of American society. We must cut as many ties with consumer society and corporations as possible. We must build a new political and economic consciousness centered on the tangible issues of sustainable agricultural self-sufficiency and radical environmental reform. The democratic system and the liberal institutions that once made a piecemeal reform possible is dead. It exists only in name only. It is no longer a viable mechanism for change. The longer we play our scripted and absurd role in this charade, the worse it will get. Do not pity Barack Obama and the Democratic Party. They'll get what they deserve. They sold the citizens out for cash and power. They lied. They manipulated and they deceived the public and the bailouts to the abandonment of universal health care to serve corporate interest. They refused to halt the wanton corporate destruction of the ecosystem in which all life depends. They betrayed the most basic ideals of democracy. And they, they, as much as the Republicans, are the problem. It is like being in a pit, Ralph Nader told me when we spoke on Saturday. If you're four feet in the pit, you have a chance to grab the top and hoist yourself up. If you're 30 feet in the pit, 
You have to start on a different scale. <laughs> Poor people do not organize, Nader lamented. They never have. It was always been people who have fairly good jobs. You don't see Walmart worker, workers massing anywhere. The people who are the most brilliant are the people who had the best blue-collar jobs. Their expectation level was high. When they felt their jobs were being jeopardized, they got really angry. But when you are at $7.25 an hour, you want to hang on to $7.25 an hour. It's a strange saying. People have institutionalized oppressive power in the form of surrender. It is not like they like it, but what are you going to do about it? You make the best of it. The system of control is staggeringly dictatorial. It breaks new ground and innovates in ways no one in human history has ever innovated. You start in American history where these corporations have influence. They have lobbyists. They run candidates. Then they put their appointments in top government positions. Now they're actually operating the government. Look at Halliburton and Blackwater. Yesterday, someone in our office called the Office of Pipeline Safety a, a propo apropos of the San Bruno explosion in California. The press woman answered. The guy in her office saw on the screen that she had CTR next to her name. He said, what's CTR? She says, I'm a contractor. He said, this is a press office at the Department of Transportation. They contracted out the press office? Yes, she says, but that's okay. I come to work here every day. The corporate state is the ultimate maturation of American-type fascism. They leave wide areas of personal freedom so that people could confuse personal freedom with civic freedom. The freedom to go where you want, eat where you want, associate with who you want, buy what you want, work where you want, sleep when you want, play when you want. If people had to give up on any civic or political role for themselves, there is a sufficient amount of elbow room to get through the day. They do not have the freedom to participate in the decisions about war, foreign policy, domestic health and safety issues, taxes or transportation. And that's genius. But one of its Achilles heels is that the price of the corporate state is a deteriorizing, deteriorating political economy. They can't stop their greed from getting the next morsel. They can't stop themselves. The question is, at what point are enough people going to have a breaking point in terms of their own economic plight? At what point will they say enough is enough? When that happens, is a Tea Party type enough or Senator uh, La Follette or Eugene uh, Debs type enough? It is anti-corporate movements as exemplified by the Scandinavian energy form Kraft and Coulter that we must emulate. Kraft and Coulter sells electricity exclusively from solar and water power. It's begun to merge clean energy with cultural events, bookstores, and a political consciousness that actively defies corporate hegemony. So Kraft and Coulter, the Scandinavian en uh, energy form, they only sell electricity from solar and water power. That's amazing. The failure by the uh, Obama administration to use the bailout stimulus money to build public works such as schools, libraries, roads, clinics, highways, pr public transit, and reclaiming dams, as well as create green jobs, has snuffed out any hope of serious economic, political, or environmental reform coming from the centralized bureaucracy of the corporate state. And since the government did not hire enough auditors and examiners to monitor how the hundreds of billions in taxpayer funds funneled to Wall Street are being spent, we will soon see reports of widespread mismanagement and corruption. The rot and corruption at the top levels are our financial and political systems, coupled with the increasing deprivation felt by tens of millions of Americans, are volatile tender for a horrific right-wing backlash in the absence of a committed socialist alternative. If you took a day off and did nothing but listen to Hannity, Beck, and Limbaugh and realize that this goes on 260 days a year, you would see that it is overwhelming. You have to almost be a genetic, uh, almost have to have a genetic resistance in your body and mind not to be affected by it. These guys are very good. They're clever. They're funny. They're emotional. It beats me how Air America didn't make it except it went. It criticized corporations and corporations advertise. These right wingers go after government and government doesn't advertise. That's the difference. It's it isn't that their message appeals more. Air America starved because it could not get advertisements. We do not have much time left, and the longer we refuse to confront corporate power, the more impotent we become as society breaks down. The game of electoral politics, which is given legitimacy by the right and the so-called left on the cable news shows, is just that, a game that diverts us from what should be our daily task, dismantling piece by piece the iron grip that corporations hold over our lives. Hope is a word that is applicable only to those who grasp reality, however bleak, and do something meaningful to fight back which does not include the farce of elections involvement in mainstream political parties. Hope is about fighting against the real forces of destruction, not chanting yes we can in rallies orchestrated by marketing experts, television crews, pollsters, and propagandists, or begging Obama to be Obama. Hope in the hands of realists spreads fear into the black heart of the corporate elite, but hope, real hope remains thwarted by our collective 
self-delusion. 